If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah, there goes. The blubbity bar. The blubbity bar. Sending out good vibes. The blubbity bar. Good vibes. The bar. Good vibes. The blubbity bar. Good vibes. Good vibes. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. And if you add to that, just eyes closed. And when you close your eyes, your attention immediately comes into your body. That combination of your attention within yourself, slow, deep breaths, filling your Buddha belly and a hand on a heart, hand on your lower abdomen, just that. If you did just that. All right, guys, welcome back to the Ray America Show. We are going to be chatting with Lindsay Don't. Toss the Charmin, was it you no, said? No, no. Oh. Don't say it on here. Oh. Jesus. Why? I was just trying to, because it, it's... What was it about? Know, it's probably being missed. It was like people squeezing the, the toilet paper or the or the uh, t- paper towels in the store. Don't oh, squeeze don't the squeeze Charmin. The sh- was this a commercial? Yeah, it was a famous commercial in the a 80s. Famous a famous commercial? Well, yeah, was, don't squeeze the Charmin. Do you just I mean, assume like that it. every commercial you see is a famous commercial? If you've seen it, it's a famous commercial? I've never everybody seen this knows, Everybody knows about it. You were coming from up north in oh. Timbuktu in Canada. So, yeah, you probably... You were in Canada too, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You're a few hundred miles further south of me. Well, you let us know if you've ever heard of Don't Squeeze the Shaman. Oh, see, that's just not good. To, this isn't associated at all with Lindsay. It's a great show with Lindsay, though. It was a great show with Lindsay. I can't believe we haven't had her on yet. Yeah. Then 550 episodes. So uh, she's got a new book out, which was, did you read it? No, I didn't. Did, no. I like the audio books. I get that. Me too. You like the Me audio too. books more than most people. I've been reading, I have been reading a couple of great books for shows. I got, we got a couple of awesome shows coming up though. Let's talk about it. Now we got Gordon White coming up with about his book, Animistic. And Dr. Peter Bregan about COVID and the, the global predators that'll probably show up in our Grimerica Outlaw feed. COVID? We're talking COVID yeah. again? Well, yeah. Phase yeah. two. Yeah. It's it, it's pretty it's a pretty damning book. Quite a lot of against China on that. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Something else just came out the other day I was looking at too. It was a long article about COVID crap. And uh, isn't what's her name still in court? Uh, I think she, I, I don't know. I thought she was out. Uh, uh, she was in court. Our, you're talking about our Hinge Alberta off. health representative was four days answering questions in court. I don't really know what happened with that. Actually, we also have Michael Cremo coming on too. That'll be fantastic. I mean, we had him on like hundred four hundred something episodes ago, yeah. probably. We have Ralph Ellis coming for uh, Jesus and the Egyptians. Uh, Leonard Lee Bushel, hi, talking about confessions of a pot smoking addict. And guess what? That landed on 420 by accident. Really? Yeah. By and accident? Omar, Omar Khan from Uncommon Wisdom. He's got an awesome website and blog uh, with a lot of cool articles just to let everybody know. Is that know the what's guy I thought on. might have been the terrorist? That Canadian terrorist that, That's that, the guy, uh, yeah. that we paid yeah. off? Uh, Shannon Taggart too, uh, hotbed of metaphysical activity. She's Shannon coming back Taggart. on and Chris Duffin. He's a strength, like one of the, uh, a strength, uh, trainer. He's I got thought I seen awesome Marty, the one night party in there. And then Marty, the Yogi's coming over to the studio. That'll be great. Back in studio. Is this the third time? Yeah, he's, uh, no, I don't Maybe think I should so. Hide second the damaged time, yeah. artwork. But he's been to India a couple of times since we last talked to him. He's become a Yogi really. So, He's got, it'll be awesome to have him in studio. That'll be outlawed too, probably. That'll be a couple hours. So, anyways, just to give people an idea of what's coming up. What's coming up? <laughs> You're off to the states again. You yeah. want to see? You'll be hanging out with Randall in a couple days. Yeah. Randall and Brad checking out checking out some stuff at Soap Lake. Are you meeting any Grand Americans? No, I don't. Uh, no, I don't think so. None. No. Most people are too far away from that. Not even Justin. 
Huh. Maybe, Justin. You guys could play D&D in person. Sucks with two people, though. You could have know. brought down your outfit. I don't know. Doesn't it suck with two people? I mean, it seems like it sucks with six people. It's got to just be weird <laughs> with two people. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a 50-50 chance you just end up making out. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. I'm a princess. <laughs> I'm a prince. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you got for us? Uh, anyways, what you? I want to finish off the chat, the, your thought there about the uh, Alberta health thing. So she was, I think... I heard I saw something about Alberta um, not bringing back in the um, any more uh, measures, and it, and I, and I thought that's kind of weird timing after she's been being grilled for four days in court over this. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not, but we'll see. I mean, I've I've also heard rumors that measures are coming back as well. Um, back here, the new scary. Into, well, in, Is there in people other parts in of Canada or something. So we'll see. Huh. I've completely moved on. Just out in the real world, there's just no talk of it anymore. I know. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's great. It is great. It really is great to be out and about a bit. And people are starting to be more open about uh, well, how bullshitty it was. Well, sure. today in BC, they lifted the VAX mandates so people can go oh, out for dinner and to social events again. Those poor bastards. Yeah, BC is just lagging. So what did we say? We said we wouldn't do it again? Um, No, I don't want to go that far. Oh. Just now, maybe, for the sixth wave, or or just now. I mean, Sixth I, wave? I There's another knows. wave? But everyone's vaccinated and had <laughs> COVID. I know. I know. <laughs> it's hard to... <laughs> this is crazy. We can't make sense of it, Aaron. There's no point in trying. I, I don't bother. I don't no. bother. All so, the birthday parties and sleepovers and stuff are all fucking wide open and back on. So, so I got a kind of like a quote and, an, and a, a different type of operation project and also a great synchronicity that I can't wait to read. Wobble, 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 wobble. What you want to do first? I opened the wrong app. Do the synchro. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the synchro first. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a rambling gram with synchronicities all over the web. And Aaron is skeptical about everyone and don't believe it yet. You can start eating. So we love hearing from people all over the world, synchronicities, trip reports, sightings, crazy experiences, spiritual awakenings, whatever story you know you want to send us. You can email us. I think some emails come through on the contact site on our new, like Darren had the websites uh, redone. So sometimes they come through on that, but many times uh, people don't put their emails on there. So I can't reply to them. So just a heads up. If you are going to send something uh, in the sites, contact thing, you can do that, but just put your email in there so I can reply. Otherwise you can send an email to Graham at GrahamAmerica.com or you can join the chats. There's other ways to get a hold of us. Darren, Darren is the one that handles the Twitter's. Twitter. Anyways, this is a this is a great one. This is synchro. So uh, this is from. Uh, I'll just say it's from John. I don't know if I should. I mean, this is. There's no. Yeah, John. <clears throat> Hi, Graham. Thought I would send in a synchro I had today. It's a funny one. This is my favorite. This is my favorite type. This is this. Well, for me at least. So I'm from Leeds, England. I work as a postman, which means I get to listen to podcasts every day. I've been listening to Grime Erica for years. I can't remember exactly how long, but I would guess I started at around episode 50, maybe. wonder what episode Bitty. 50 was. Wouldn't that be weird if it was Michael Cremo? I'll check. Okay. Anyway, today I was listening to the latest episode while I was wandering the streets, delivering letters and parcels, and you start talking about how you're not, how you're not growing for 14 years. Darren was talking and laughing about you being short and the thought popped into my head. It was like a flashback, like an old memory suddenly appeared in my head and I smiled to myself. The memory which had crawled up from the depths of my mind was the jingle I had made and sent in. I hadn't thought about it for years. And just as I was remembering and smiling to myself, Darren played the fucking jingle. The jingle about your ripped calves. 
Nice. I don't he know. Made it? I don't know when the last time it was played. Oh, was. and you accused him of being a deep faker. <laughs> <Just made up. laughs> I don't know when the last time it was played was, but I haven't heard it on your show for years. And I mean, honestly, it has been years since you've played that probably. It was maybe two or three seconds between me thinking about it and hearing it. Then you started saying it was a deep fake. This made me actually laugh out loud and made a few random people who were close by start staring at me like I was mental. Now for the exclusive, there was a lot of talk on the old forum about who had made the jingle and who the user Graham's calf implants was. Well, it was me. Ha ha. Oh, he was the user on our old platform called Graham's Calf Implants. I can confirm now that all the audio in the jingle is taken from episodes of Grimerica. None of it is deep fake. It is all your own words. I cut bits out and stuck them together and added some music, all done on my phone with a free app I found. I also have to give credit to Felix, who worked his magic and made it sound a lot better than it did when I first sent it to him. So he's collaborating with Felix on deep, deep. It's a deep fake team. On deep but you fake... said all these things. What well, are you saying about pretty rip? That's a that's a that's to me a I'd deep like to fake. Know, that's a it? deep fake. I mean, I, you don't. Or maybe he thinks a deep fake is like you take my a voice deep fake and you is, make. Yeah, you make that's your... that's a deep fake. This would be a fraud. What? This no, no, I, no. Deep fake is you just take people's no, words no, and no, mash no. them deep together. Deep fake is fucking. You can make someone look like they're saying something even. On video, yeah, yeah, but this is an audio deep fake. No, 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 no. You never. You just, you just so willy nilly with these definitions. I mean, you would be a terrible lawyer. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to hear from people. I think a deep fake is when you take is people's anything? mishmashes. Is anything? But we've been doing that. And we, you mash no, that's them just together a fake. in a sentence. That's just a fake. That's not a. That's deep just fake. not a deep fake. That's no. just a fake. No. So a deep fake would I be. I get taking... it. You're a short dude. You've never seen a deep fake. You're already underwater. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I find you I find I hope you find the synchro as funny as I did and all the people who have wondered for years whose Graham's calf implants was. It's me, John from Leeds, England. Cheers and keep up the great work. Oh, that's fantastic, Synchro. Right, do you gonna rate that? I mean, that is pretty good. I mean it especially the way you describe the memory coming up. I'll give him an eight, you know. An eight. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. So that's a, uh, that's a good one. Episode 50, Grammarica Meditates. Meditate with Grammarica in the first In Igloo podcast. Ajay, Alicia, and Roseanne are in this episode to teach us about meditation. Let's listen. Wow. Through meditation, you can... Uh, that's... We always had those uh, silly things. I told well, Adam that's, to take uh, those. I asked that's Adam to take name, those right? all out when he was working for us. Alicia, I forgot Alicia. That's my Reiki teacher. I forgot she came in and did that with us. You need to be a present. You need to be aware. And meditation can be any form. Like just oh, to, yeah. To Jay, too, yeah. The energy, you have to be there. All right, He's guys, welcome post. back to uh, the Grimerica show. <laughs> Actually, this is our special meditation episode. That's um, right. Yeah, the audio is a little sketchy at best, but it, well, it's not that bad. Uh, it's just we use the Yeti mic. Yeah, we had everybody fucking yeah, Yeti. Everybody around the you mic wouldn't talking give it up. It, so <laughs> it's it should be pretty good, but it just won't be uh, the same as usual. You just wanted yep, to use a Yeti because it was exactly, called a but Yeti. It's good. It's definitely listenable by by all means. Just want we sound you guys way to less comfortable. Uh, so we're gonna keep it short and sweet. We're out of town this weekend. I don't so this sound is very comfortable. Of, uh, I feel like. We've been sitting on this one. We I figured we'd fire it out. Yeah, this is. Uh, we had AJ, <laughs> Alicia Alibi, and Rosanna Sardella in the studio talking about meditation and their groups and all kinds of good stuff. Maybe we got worse. Ah, that was good. Yeah, that was that was that was interesting. I'm sure. I'm sure I would have. Uh, that would have been a fun one. So that was probably like just under a year into the podcast. You know, it was like episodes. exactly a year in. Yeah, it was wow. uh, Thursday, May first, 2014. Oh no. Because we were calling May 23rd was... Uh, May 24th. Yeah, so we must almost hit like exactly 52 episodes that first year. So uh, you weren't even close to either side of that. You had Chris Ryan, 48, Robert Schock, 49, 
And then you had Brad Burge on the other side and Amit Goswami. Ooh, that was the, the fun Amit Goswami. Doobie doobie yeah. doobie doo. All right. Where you got? Um, I got uh, <clears throat> something from Steve Kirsch's uh, newsletter. And Who's I thought that? it'd be fun to talk about it on the show. Uh, so I'm going to link to that. And I'm also going to link to the, the article that comes from his article. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote and then get, and then sort of talk about a little project operation. That's not really a technical project operation, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's an effect. Like not the Mandela effect, but like it. another effect. Effect or an affect? It's the profound quote of the week. Effect. <laughs> Darren, can you guess it? It's the profound quote of the week. Can you guess the human who spoke it? You might have a. You might have a. You might have a good chance at this one. One of the saddest lessons of history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. Dave McGowan. Uh, Nope. Bill Gates. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, he, sci- he was a famous scientist. Carl Sagan. Yeah. The demon haunted world. Science as a candle in the dark. And it came from this called the Bernie Madoff effect. You see the scammer? Yeah. He made off with all everyone's you know, money. He was just, he was inevitably like, when you get a name like that, you're inevitably just. I remember seeing the newspaper back in the day when he got busted. Yeah. Bernie Madoff was a con man infamous for his Ponzi scheme investments. He played off the trust people gave him as an expert who purportedly showed great results, but ultimately that trust was betrayed. People want to know, people want to believe experts because they, they don't have the time, interest, or intellectual capacity to learn the necessary knowledge, a very understandable thing. As I noted in that piece of Granite Grok, as knowledge accumulated thanks to the invention of writing, knowledge in specific fields became so great that people made specialization in that field, their career, because we believe these people to be ethical based on an overall experience and societal gestalt and modern societal history. We believe them a belief until the last few years, which has more or less been viable, at least in the medical front, though trust in the enemy media has in my humble opinion, rightly been slipping for at least a decade. But a modern high trust society, stable society, is in fact an aberration. Most people have stability privilege and think, oh, that's just not possible to almost any potentially bad thing that's been discussed. And even when it starts to become clear that we have been fooled, whether on a small, large or life threatening scale, the vast majority reject it. So that's, that's the, the Bernie Madoff. That's the Bernie Madoff effect. You're trusting the experts, huh? I'm an expert. In what? what? Steel broadcasting. Steel broadcasting? insulation and construction and structural. Expert in and Darren podcasting Grimes? and Darren Grimes. I'm an aficionado of Darren Grimes and. <laughs> I'm the best Darren Grimes are out there. Actually, there's this British guy that could probably keep up pretty good. He seems like he's Darren Grimes and pretty good. He's even good more too. controversial than you, if that could be possible. Well, I don't think it's that you have to be controversial, but he seems like, you know, I'm not saying I agree with him on anything, but he's definitely not fucking scared to say what he thinks or how he feels or be authentic. So I got to respect that at a certain level. Yeah, exactly. There's at least two Darren Grimeses out there that are okay offending you. Yeah. Fuck you. Just kidding. I love you. I was talking to the listener, not to you personally. I wouldn't threaten so, you right now. You're looking so huscular from all the meat. I wouldn't want you to so, beat me yeah. up. Pretty soon so you I might gotta, be beefcake we, again. Can you imagine? You, wouldn't it be nice to get yeah. you back to beefcake a decade into the podcast? 
That was like eight years ago, Graham. When you used to have okay, contraptions, you strapped onto your shoes so you could run down hills faster. I exercise. I ran. Remember, I did the ex like cardio for a hundred days in a row there. But to start of the you, podcast, you carried right into fucking that, Sean you know? off the mountain <laughs> after he, uh, <laughs> a hike trail running. Used to break men trail running. <laughs> That's what podcasting does to you. Makes you no, a curmudgeon. No. Uh uh-uh. uh Because I'm not a curmudgeon. Most of the podcasters I know are like getting after it in some capacity. <laughs> Must be the narrating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we got Lindsay Sharman. Should I do a little bio on her quickly, or maybe we should get you to narrate some uh, inspirational uh, stuff well, inst- yeah, instead of like, all this oh, yeah, occult some... stuff all the time? Yeah, yeah, you're just yeah, like yeah. at home doing magic and playing D anD D. We gotta get you. <laughs> <laughs> all the new thought ones are already narrated. So, well, yeah, that's true. We could do mine. we could mine. do outwitting the devil for the listeners for free, yeah. Because it's common creative comments. Well, we're gonna do another. We're gonna so do another could, one. Of those. Yeah, I know, but do, you could do the, with. You could record that, and we could just release it to our listeners so they could have it, not pay for it. You know, because the only audio version of that has that annoying. I mean, she's a good author in her own right, but she's got that that Sharon Leisure or whatever cutting in all the time, which really upsets the flow of the book. So there isn't a just intact audio version of it out there. I think there is on YouTube. Like cutting I say, in, in the writing, cutting in the writing. Yeah, because she wrote a new book about it and released it. But uh, because it's Creative Commons, so we couldn't do our own version of it. But you could uh, release it for free with credit. I think that's how Creative Commons works, isn't it? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Felix would know. Are you putting something out uh, at the end of this episode then? I'm going to put the, well, since we just had our buddy Romy, homie Romy on the intro last week, we had him on Rockfin as well, did a video thing. We have a little snippet of best of of that here, a little highlight reel that we'll play. See if you guys want to go check out Rockfin and that stuff ultimately goes into Outlawed eventually too as bonus content over in Outlawed. Another reason, check out grammaricoutlaw.ca. Speaking of which, I wanted to get over to the support um, support down and you know, it's to be expected with the way of the world and with the other podcasts going and a few people migrated over to that and they're supporting over there instead, but, uh, we could use the support as we head into spring now more than ever. Graham's doing it full time and we got a million different things on the go, trying to go and grow and do what we can to make this world just a little bit of a better place. America.ca slash support, your one, two, three, four dollars a month. You decide whatever you want to sign up for, but it all goes to good use over here. And uh, we can't do it without you. So if you're getting some value from our podcast here, episode 541 or 542 or something like that, uh, maybe you can decide to head over to America.ca slash support today and sign up, make a one time donation, uh, whatever you can do to send a little value back our way in these troubled times. Um, there's also of course, all the events we do over at contact at the cabin.com. We're doing a ton. We've got 54, 55 audiobooks for sale now over at Adult Brain. Uh, I think there's like one spot, one last minute spot up available for the Utah thing right now, which I would say is probably my favorite event out of Bryce of April, Canyon. Right? Looking at stars. Yeah, it's only two or three weeks away, two weeks away. So if you want to get in on a trip like last minute, it's April 28th to May 2nd. Uh, if you want to come hang out with us and Dave Matheson, the Snake Bros, Ben from Uncharted X, Brad Brandon from Powell. Cosmographia, Brandon Powell, just a ton of fantastic, cool people. You can still get in on that. Shoot me an email, DarrenAcromerica.com, and we will get you sorted if you want to get in on that. And speaking of homie Romy, I'm currently trying to figure out some sort of collaboration on his property out in Hawaii so that we can, because that's on the big island, with probably the best stargazing in the world. So, uh... We're trying to see what we can do to to do uh, like a real uh, authentic Hawaiian sort of thing where we go down there, do the pig roast and the luau and volcano hiking and all that sort of stuff. Oh, that sounds fantastic. It'll be a very intimate thing with probably only 15 people per group, but we're looking at doing that uh, sometime next year. So contact at thecabin.com if you want to stay up to date on all that stuff. I've heard that Egypt is done now. It's max, but you can still like sign up for the waiting list and register. And if anyone backs out or anything like that, you could still get in on that. Uh, so don't rule that out. Contact at the cabin.com. It's all that stuff. Support the show. Grandmaker.ca slash support. 
You got anything else? Uh, just Lindsay's quick bio here. Oh, uh, yeah, do yeah. that now. Yeah, I don't have anything else besides that. Um, so she's she she was a teacher for like 14 years, and then she she finally, thank Christ, she bailed on that, um, and then just followed her basically her you know her intuition into her Rogue Ways, which is her channel and her website here. Um, she's the creator of Rogue Ways, um, and she also does uh, spiritual healing and support. Um, and uh, she's got a course as well in there, Oregon books. I heard her talk about some medicine bags and stuff too, that she makes. Um, and her goal is to serve others through sharing analog, electric concentric wisdom via exploration of conspiracy, culture, consciousness, spirituality, magic questions, exploration, freedom, liberty, community, I aim to think critically and skeptically about literally everything, following the manifold paths toward deeper wisdom and understanding of this crazy journey called life. Crazy little thing called life. Uh, I had something else I was going to say last minute. I can't remember what it was now. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, we're going to play the thing with Romy. So this be this little five or seven minute little highlight reel from the show we had with Romy. If you want to check that out, go over to rockfin.com slash grimerica. And uh, then we'll jump into the chat with Lindsay Sharman. This, this work that I'm working on is called Antiquated Transhumanism and Resonance Architecture. And so um, the, the, the concept of it comes from understanding and reading and researching a lot of um, alternative history, um, understanding occult, like kind of coding into words and, um, you know, different types of like biblical studies and everything i'm trying to look it's a really broad um way to try to conceptualize how our ancestors were understanding physics because i i have a strong inkling of intuition that this uh these empires that existed back uh you know back in antiquity they had access to energy Ether energy, plasma energy. They understood magnetics, conductive materials. They understood consciousness. They understood toroids. And um, for some reason, I think that that's been suppressed from our current understanding. And so if we lived in such a high technological civilized um, society, an empire known as Atlantis and the Atlanteans, which by count of people, if we can take them as credible sources, Edgar Casey, Plato, um, you know, so on and so forth, that Atlantis had technology and they were a, a high technological civilization. And then the deluge came, right? The fucking deluge came <laughs> and wiped out everything. And then no longer were we able, able to access ether energy or understand the magnetic poles and... And the argument being presented here is that the ancestral line we've been fed through history is in and out of complete truce, like a sine wave pulsing over and under a streamline, a fictitious understanding of time. And time itself is not linear. Thus, it does not grow and evolve. The invention of time, reading devices like dials, swatches, and clocks shows us this by their cylindrical design. So this theorem consists of a broad intuitive understanding and willingness to be open that our planet in this realm and our bodies are electrically attuned and attached in the source field. This thick goop that allows us to connect when the operator of our conductive bodies is ready to turn on and tune in. At the same time, I want to paint a visual of how this idea can be viewed from an aerial position. Earth is like a vessel in a lab, sterilized and controlled environment, and we are like the electrons in a lipid solution. Controlling the charge, whether very high or very low, it allows a vibrational movement to essentially attune to the observer or the controller of the experiment. Okay, well, bounce back into the good stuff. We're living in a very electrical environment, 
And this general understanding is not well adept to our mainstream society, but known in areas of serious science, potentially for centuries. Somewhere along the line, seemingly between the 14th and 19th century, is the biggest cover-up of history through the invention of the alphabet as we know it, modern English, and modern science. Transhumanism is a movement that aims to use technology to enhance human intellect, physiology, and psychological abilities. This can be anything from brain implants to bionic eyes, stealth sim research, and exoskeleton bodysuits. Transhumanism is a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life-promoting principles and values. That's from Max Moore in 1990. He's still very current in the transhumanist movement. From crowns and coronets to Neuralink and nanotech. In this picture, you have an incredibly decadent Vedic crown. And wow. I mean, the, the art here is just absolutely amazing. The crow is the sign of putrefaction, which is the first kind of step into when you're uh, uh, talk, talking about the alchemical steps, um, which, you know, if you read alchemical uh, uh, text, Roger Bacon, Falconelli and, and these other famous alchemists, you know, they, they'll tell you the steps and the crow's beak um, or Hermes, Hermes ashes of the Hermes or the Hermes tree. That's that means you're in the right step if you have the black compost that they call it so that's the crown astrologically speaking the crown was referenced to the stars in the sky and the zodiac wheel to wear this crown is to be the center of the divine knowledge his mind understands cosmic laws and brings them to this earth his rule is divine you're like can everybody leave so i can take this thing off oh yeah <laughs> that's gotta be hard on a neck <laughs> that's you know uh, that's another that's a great point is um they weren't wearing these things all the time, right? Why would you wear something like this in battle? Well, to maybe heighten your senses, right? You have access to these uh, chemical properties. Um, I also think that they were charging these things up before they put it on. If they have some sort of like vibrational uh, chamber or dipping it in a saltwater solution, leaving it in the sun. Um, for instance, I use crystals a lot for meditation I'm a, I'm a yogi yoga saved my life everybody so i have to keep doing it and i have to preach the goodness of um stretching your body and, and connecting and uh i i i i've had some transcendental experiences with using crystals and what i'll do is i'll actually heat them up i got a fireplace i'll heat them up in a pot with salt water and you could take these things out um even after you know like the water doesn't have to be hot or anything you take them out of the water and you can feel you can feel the vibration in the crystal. I mean, like it feels like it's it's moving slightly, like there's some sort of static uh, energy going on there. But yeah, this is 35, uh, uh, 3500 BCE. This is the oldest remnants of this. You know, this isn't stemming from um, monotheistic religious points of view by any means. This this predates. Uh, you know, this predates all of the other crowns that we just saw, like all of this. So this is obviously a very old tradition. It's floating around, floating around. You have the hot, you have the ground, but what's connecting it to that, right? That's what we do. That's what um, power poles do. That's what uh, a, a lightning rod does, you know, when lightning attracts that, you know, that, that kind of thing. So a staff um, when you're wearing shoes is the thing that gets you grounded into the earth. So it's your grounding cord. And this symbol has been taken and ripped off. It was used as the, um, the Roman empire, the Romanovs from Russia. It's also, like I said, a 32nd degree Freemason symbol. It's completely random. Uh, also be Gobekli Tepes, Tepes in Turkey too. Antiquated technologies and spiritual resonance talismanic energy um here we have uh an ancient sumer art uh and they their obsession with the pine cone and pine forest that's a whole other thing uh if you guys listen to the show everybody out there all the things they'll know that i'm obsessed with pine pollen uh pine pollen is one of earth's most beautiful uh herbal medicines and i think this is Pine pollen is 
what we use to decalcify our pineal gland and connect our our uh, our body to the earth system oh okay that's right okay everybody so i'm opening up this invitation to um anybody who wants to join in so i'm, I'm a farmer um by trade it's my favorite thing to do i love connecting with the earth and i've been living uh off and on the big island of hawaii for 10 years and i just came upon some property and i've been saving money the first time in my life and um i got a really nice chunk of change saved up myself next thing is i'm opening up a gofundme to people that want to contribute to a sustainable farm on the big island of hawaii and so through the sustainable farming we will um build small pyramids on the property to collect pyramid energy and grow plants inside of we're going to put a few yurts it's going to be 100 percent solar um, we want to do primitive hot tubs and we're going to kind of open it up as like a farm slash resort. Now we're not talking, you know, a hundred acres or anything. We're actually talking one acre, but we're going to create such an environment within that one acre that this resort is going to be open up for anywhere to five to six people at a time. And it's going to be very cozy and really comfortable and you're going to be able to feel the effect of pyramid energy and the really great part about this location is we are on one of the chakra points of the earth you have volcanic energy bro you have magmatic energy and you have one of the major ley lines which is in south point which is just a few miles of the farm so i want to be able to share this experience with anybody who is down to uh, put in any money into the GoFundMe, if you put um, some funds into the project, it doesn't matter the amount at this point. If you are doing it at this early stage, you can put in $20 and I'll pick you up from the airport. You could put in $1,000 and you bet your ass I'll pick you up the airport and drive you all around the island and show you, show you my favorite things. We'll go YPO. Um, we'll do tours. Charmin, welcome to Grand America. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure and an honor to finally be here with you guys. I have long loved you and your show. You're an inspiration. Thanks. Yeah, you too. I mean, I just started, I listened a little bit recently to you and I, our, some of our stories are similar. Some of our stories are similar. So, I mean, maybe we'll start there. Like, I, I, I still don't really know your sort of, not your whole story, but you know what I mean? Like a little bit about your background and how you kind of got into what you're doing. Maybe we could yeah. start there. I want to yeah, hear. I, I definitely want to hear about your story with the light ball at the f- expo, the the spirit expo. So you got to include that in there. That was wild. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. How did I get here? I don't know. I'm a teacher by training, so I did 14 years in public education. Oh and, wow. Yeah, master teacher, board certified, all the special bells and whistles that anybody might want to say. Like, yeah, she's really respectable. Um, but at the same time, they hated me deeply most of the time because I do things very differently and I think I do them well, but that means I challenge their systems and their paradigms and their, um, you know, acceptable ways of their accepted ways of being very lazy and uncaring towards children. So I got a lot of pushback and, um, finally after 14 years, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. It's really tearing my soul and my heart, my body apart. And people always assume it was the children. They're like, oh yeah, the kids are just rough. 
Like, no, the kids are amazing. Those are the only, that's the only reason I could stay there that long is because I love, I love kids. And, um, you know, they're a nightmare sometimes, but that's why I was there was to love them through it. And, and that wasn't what tore me apart. It was really the adults and how blind and horrifying they tend to be and how horrifying the system is, right? I went into it to try to buffer kids from that system. And you can only buffer so long before you're just battered. How old are so, the kids? They're a sixth to 12th grade. So wow. middle school and high yeah, school, yeah. mostly high school. But if you look at all my years combined, it was mostly in high schools. Um, so in a lot of 12th and 11th grade. So I got like, you know, the, I love, I love both ends. I love the sixth graders. They're still so like tiny and like dumb and I don't want to say dumb, but you know, naive. And they're just like still cute and innocent. And then the 12th graders are like, you know, they're almost adults. They can talk about, and we can have serious discussions and it's pretty cool to watch them trans transforming into their true selves. And, you know, I love, I love all of the grades, but, um, yeah. And it, so I loved it, but, but I had to eventually leave. And so when I left, I left with like a, a bang and I, um, decided to sell my house, uh, leave the man who I was with, who I, at the time totally would have thought I was going to be my husband, um, sold my car and left the state that I had lived in. And I've traveled a lot around the world and I taught in some other countries and stuff. So it's not like I had never like left, but I'd always pretty much lived in Washington state in the Pacific Northwest. And I got into a van and I drove around the country uh, and the continent, actually, through Canada as well, which we were just talking about before the show. Um, and I had no real goal except to just not teach. That was my only goal. <laughs> and, you know, with all my accolades and stuff, I had like accrued some bonuses and I used my bonus money from the past few years to just fund this pure uh, vacation <laughs> where I was just, you know, going. I got to see Laird Hot Springs and Banff and Jasper and all of these beautiful, you know, national parks up there and Alaska and the coastline over there is amazing. And it was so beautiful. Uh, and I just actually slept most of the time. I put my hammock up wherever I landed and just slept most of the day. Uh, and then I eventually ended up in Colorado and now I'm here and um, everything has kind of unfolded from there. So I've always done tarot and had sort of a very spiritual series of experiences throughout my life. Um, but now I was able to finally actually offer that to people. Um, you know, and I had some other jobs to sort of patch up the time in between starting that and leaving teaching. And, and now I just do that full time and it's awesome. I provide spiritual healing and support to people and tarot and, um, you know, teaching a spiritual guidance for people and all sorts of things. And so it's a, it's a very similar to what I've always been doing, but it's also very different and super cool. Uh, and the light ball story plays a role in it, actually. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was that was pretty wild. I um, this was, I think this was like right before I got in the van. I think this was like I was already knew I was leaving teaching. I wasn't quite gone yet, uh, and I was down in Portland. I was visiting someone, and they uh, sort of ditched me last minute for uh, many many hours, and I didn't have a car, and um you know, I'm in a city, so I can go anywhere. But I was also like, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what I want to do because it was just last minute. So for the first time in my life, I looked at Facebook events. I think that's what it's called. It's like, what's going on around you? You can just like peruse a different thing. So like, maybe there's something fun. Uh, so I looked and there was something one mile away and it was a beautiful day. And I was like, oh, I can walk to something one mile away. What's this? And it was like the something, something like spiritual fair. And I was like, oh, that's going to be really stupid, like really retarded. Uh, but it'll be funny. It'll be walk. It'll be a nice day. Maybe there'll be some cool. I like crystals. Like maybe there's going to be some crystals there or whatever. So I went, even though I was pretty sure it was going to be full of people pretending to be psychic, you know, like the cold readers and like the, all the tricks that we all know. And there's just so many charlatans all the time. So I was pretty sure it was going to be just that, but I walked there anyway, wasting some time. I got there, I got in, there's some crystals right away. I was right about that. They were cool. And I picked one up. <laughs> but I think it's actually the only time I've ever bought crystals. Uh, people tend to just give them to me and I have like a lot now and they just have come to me. But uh, I did buy some that day and I was wandering around and there was this booth that caught my eye because it was so unadorned. You know, like people have their like backdrops and they have their logo and their banners and their stuff is all nicely stacked with lights on it and stuff. This guy had just like rolled out of bed. His hair is like messy. His shirt's like barely tucked in. He's just got like some books thrown on a table and he's just like, <laughs> I was like, what is this guy? But behind him or like to the side of him was this book 
And I saw it and I instantly was like, whoa, what the fuck? Like it blew my mind right away because I remembered in that moment that I had dreamt about this book the night before. And that's not actually the first time that's happened to me, but I, it's the first time it's happened in this way where I saw the image of the book in the dream and then saw it in real life the very next day. Like, was that, that the first time you'd ever seen the book? Ever. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Never seen it before. I mean, that my conscious mind knows of at least yeah, perhaps yeah, I yeah. had, and yeah, just, yeah. I don't know, yeah. but I definitely never thought about it. And if I had thought about it, I would have thought what I thought much later when clarity had come back because in the moment I was just mind blown, but I would, I would never read this book. Like it's such a stupid sounding book to me. Like it was just, it's called something like, I think it's actually called peace at last. And then there's a subtitle that's something about like John Lennon returns from death. And I'm like, stupid, really like dumb cover, badly drawn. It's not badly drawn. It's just, it just looks stupid to me. So I'm like, I wouldn't, ever pick this book up. If someone handed it to me, and was like, read this. I'd be like, no, no, thank you. I'm not wasting my time on that. But because it happened like this, I was like, I have to read it. Right. So I saw it. I was like, whoa, oh my God. And he was close enough that he went, what? And I was like, that book. And he was like, what about it? And I was like, I dreamt of that book last night. He's like, oh, okay, this is for you. And I was confused. I thought he was telling me I have to buy it, which I kind of felt like I had to anyway. So I was like, okay, I guess like how much money is it then? And he's like, no, no, it's for you. I, I, it's for you. Just have it. He's like, I was told to bring it for someone and it's you. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck? (laughs) I was not planning on coming here. I wasn't supposed to do this today. Totally random. Happened to look, happened to walk here. Here we are now. He's like, oh yeah, it's all meant to be. It's all arranged by our psyches and our subconscious and our souls while we sleep. And I'm like, I've always kind of thought that I've always kind of experienced weird things and really weird things a lot of them, (laughs) but I've never had another human, like really confirm it to me and be a part of it. Like openly just like, yeah, that's how life is. So I was like, wow, maybe there are some people here who actually like get it. And also who's this guy. And also I wonder what this book is about. I did end up reading the book eventually. Yeah. The night night before even. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? (laughs) Yeah. The night before. And you didn't know about the book. It was a book you didn't know about, but you dreamt about it. And there it was. Yep. Which again, it's happened to me before in different ways. So the other times I've had books come to me in dreams, someone has come up to me in the dream and they have to often yell at me and they know it because I'll forget. (laughs) Otherwise, that they're like, world shaman. And I'm like, okay, dude, like calm down. (laughs) And I like, I woke up in the morning and I was like, okay, world shaman. I don't know what's that. And I type in world shaman and it's a book. And I'm like, of course it is. So I order it and read it. And, you know, that one had a message for me too. And so my my guides or allies or whatever you like to call these uh, forests, I mean, forests, my highest self, whatever you like to call it, I don't care. They clearly uh, understand how I work and understand how to get messages to me because otherwise I'd be like, screw you, I'm not doing that. But this like caught my eye, I had to, right? So I read it. It does. It did have some messages I needed to hear and it did have some things that I think are silly, but I don't care. I just like don't attach to those things. So that same day, that same guy, he's like, Hey, you know, I have a talk later today I'm giving. Um, and if you want to come to it, it's in this room at this time. And I was like, Oh, perfect. Cause that'll kill another hour. I need to kill like four hours. So <laughs> that's great. I'll come to your talk. And I wandered around and did some other things that also ended up being very crazy and weird. But eventually I went to his talk and I got to his little room and I don't know. There's maybe like 10 or 20 people there. There's like not a lot of people. Um, and he's talking about reflexology and like, he actually had a lot of little tips and tricks about different things you can do that are really easy that will help ground you or just help you like be open-minded or care more caring or whatever you want to be like different things you can do and how to heal your body through reflexology, these different points we have that we can um, use. And it actually worked. I don't remember what my pain at the moment was, but I did have something and he like showed me the spot on my hand and I pressed on it and the pain went away. I was like, I mean, it could be placebo, but it works. So that's cool. So we're talking and he's talking and he gets like, I don't know, 20, half an hour, maybe into the talk. And, uh, this light ball came through the wall <laughs> and I know like that is crazy enough for most people, but Again, for me, uh, I'd seen many, many orbs and light balls all throughout my life, often in the night sky, sometimes in the day sky, sometimes in the, you know, nearby to me day and night all the time. 
lots of them. So I'm not very surprised by seeing a light fall anymore, but I am surprised when it comes in front of a group of people, because my understanding of other people is that they don't see light balls and orbs and don't interact with these types of things and probably think you're crazy when you talk about it. So for it to appear in front of people, I'm like, well, this is crazy. So I'm like looking around at everyone. I'm like, is this going to be like the moment where I find out that everybody actually sees these things or, you know, interacts with them or whatever? And I still don't know if anybody in that room even noticed it. Like I just, nobody reacted at least. And I really don't think they did, especially now knowing more about this type of event that I just happened to be at. I think most people there like don't really believe in anything and they're just there to see like what's out there and what weird people are doing and talking about, or, you know, like some of them I think are genuinely curious. And I think a lot of them are more like, what really is all this crap? Right. So I don't think they noticed it. It came in through the wall. It wasn't like super bright or like, you know, it's like almost like, God, how would you even describe it? It's like if there was a bad TV overlay and like just a really vague light is like floating around like old 70s graphics or something. Like a pastel orb instead of it being bright or something? It's a bright light, but it's like it's um, faded out. Uh, What is that Like the things in Dune 1984? The uh, I don't know. The, uh, fuck, I forget what those lights are called now. Are they like the little drones that kill? They're like no, it's just drones? like a little fucking light that follows you around and you can set it to all different settings as like, just like what oh, they yeah. did for light. Instead of having a light bulb, it was like this floating fucking thingamajig. I bet it is like that. I don't remember exactly what that looks like, but it's like if you had the image at full opacity and then you like too, lowered dude. the opacity so yeah. you could see through yeah. it. It's still yeah. a bright light, but no it's not translucent. Bright. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Or, thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of dim almost, but yeah, it is glowing anyway. So it's, it just kind of comes in, it kind of hovers and moves a little bit and then it just plops into the guy's head. And I, he didn't seem to notice it come in either, but he also didn't seem surprised <laughs> that it plopped into his head. So I figure this is something that happens to him frequently that he's like worked at, practiced at, or invited or something. I don't think it could just plop into anybody's head. Rather, I don't know if it would choose to plop into anybody's head. <laughs> so, and clearly later I realized he knew exactly what was going on. So the light plops into his head. And I'm still like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't take any acid today. All these people don't seem to notice anything weird. Clearly though, when it when it popped into his head, he like shook, he like just kind of shook, like he felt it or something. And then his mannerisms changed. Like it's still his body, his face, his voice technically, but he's like a different person. And he starts talking and I don't, I wish I recorded it. I wish I could remember all of it. I don't even know for sure how long it went on. I was just in stunned silence, like remember every single bit of this, like this is crazy. But what I really remember the most is that he got to this point, he said, you know, the world is going to get very dark and it's going to be very bad and it's going to start in 2022. This is like 2018 that I'm hearing this. I'm like, fuck, that's like only four years away. Uh, And it's going to be, you know, what you call the end times or the apocalypse or whatever. And he's obviously saying this much better than I'm saying it right now. I'm sure he didn't say the word whatever. And you know, this'll be, this'll be a dark time for 11 years. And don't worry because the whole time, no matter how dark it gets, the light will be with you. It's always with you. You carry it with you. You can always call on it. This consciousness is actually here and this consciousness will return more fully in 2033 and the darkness will be over. And I think he called it the Christ consciousness. And I had heard of Christ consciousness before, but I had never seen an orb fly into someone's head to tell me about the end times in connection with Christ consciousness. And then the orb just plop out of his head and boop, flew and away. And you saw it come out of his wall. head too? Yeah. Yep. Wow. And didn't he, <laughs> men- didn't he mention that somebody had visited him? Like that, that yeah, there was- he, he shook again and he, and he like, he actually made a really weird face. Um, that I have seen before since then on um, the Maori people when they're doing their, God, I don't remember what that uh, really intense, like masculine, like dance tribal uh, warrior thing is called, but that they do this like tongue out and like face really, it's like their war cry or something. Mm -hmm. He did that face. No sound came out, but he did that face. So I don't know what that's about, but you know, popped out. He did that and he kind of shook. And then he said, that wasn't me. 
that was Sai Baba. And I was like, what the hell is Sai Baba? <laughs> and no one seemed to care. <laughs> no one seemed to notice or care. And all I can think looking back is that they thought he had like memorized a little speech by Sai Baba and then said afterwards that that's what it was and didn't notice the light ball and didn't notice him change mannerisms. And it just blew my mind because I'm like, for the, for, many times in my life, I've seen really incredible things that people may notice even in the moment. And then later are like, no, that never happened. And I'm like, Dude, so like weird. I just think some people just cannot handle it in the moment or they don't want to. So in the moment they might be like, wow, that's really trippy. And then be like, let's never think of this again. You know, we, we see various levels of denial and cognitive dissonance. And I just think it's something like that, even when this is good, as far as I'm concerned, like it's pretty good if there's ascended masters or whatever Sai Baba is. Well, I was just, uh, go deep, ahead. Right? Deeply loving who come and share with us whatever messages they can get through the right channels at the right time. I mean, I'm happy about it. It was overwhelming. I was like, I guess this is reality. I guess I have to admit that this type of thing happens Ooh. now. But well, there's nothing bad about it. Well, right? I mean, I've been, I don't know. I mean, I've been thinking about this. I was going to add, before you even mentioned Sai Baba, because that kind of, it confirms sort of my late, one of my latest hypotheses that there is these ascended masters that are human still living, maybe physically even in the brotherhoods or the adepts or these people that have learned to travel in these astral realms and send messages and visit people and see people and people can see them. And maybe it's, maybe it's these, it's not like, you know, an ET or even an interdimensional thing. It's just a master somewhere sending messages through the astral realm, you know? Yeah. And, and Sai Baba, isn't he, is he still alive supposedly, or is he supposedly an old, he's, like, supposedly he's dead uh, and has been for a while, okay. but I know that according, you know, in Taoist traditions and Buddhist traditions, like in various traditions, there are people who are, immortals or who have lived very very long and they're in hiding they're not like in hiding yeah, yeah, but yeah. they're not trying to be out in the world being like look i'm 800 years old like they're in like a cave somewhere they're like really hidden but they can exactly travel around their consciousness can move around they can bring messages to people they can bilocate so he actually told the story of Bi sai baba right after this um you know, apparently because Sai Baba plopped into his head and shared all that, he was like, well, maybe you guys should know a little bit about Sai, because I don't know who Sai Baba is. And actually, there's many gurus called Sai Baba, so you have to, like, find this specific one. But he apparently uh, had a relationship with James Dean, and this is one of the things he shared with us. But I was just like, this is so random. Like, why James Dean? So James Dean apparently was flying off of a cliff in his car, uh, going to die. You're like, like, he's fast tall cliff, fast car, flying off of it, and Sai Baba appears next to him in his car in the passenger seat. He had met Sai Baba. Apparently, they have some kind of relationship. I don't really remember and haven't learned too much about that. But it wasn't like he just appeared out of nowhere. Like, they had somehow had some connection or whatever. And Sai Baba appeared, in, and he talks about it. This is, like, on the record in whatever various ways in the West. Um, and Sai Baba appeared, and he did not die because Sai Baba was there, like protecting him and holding him as the car like hit and smashed. And he kept the smashed up car with like the bubble of protection around where he was to remind himself, like this is reality, I guess. <laughs> um, so that's super weird too. Like, why James Dean? Why save his life in that way? I don't know. Was it so people like us would talk about it forty years later, however long ago that was? And I don't know. That's so crazy. Weird. Well, so then, so what, what it makes me think about is, you know, we talk about this dark force or this, you know, good and evil or something that's controlling the people that want to control everybody else. And so if, if the good masters can do it, then there's probably bad masters that can do it too. So, you yeah. know, are they doing their Sai Baba thing and this guru in the expo and they're doing the equivalent to that in the, in the white house or whatever political or, you know, I mean, makes yes. you wonder, you know? I, I would guess so. I have the exact same thought and mm -hmm. I don't know why not. What I do really deeply believe, and I know it's like possibly wrong, whatever, but I just think it's most likely true that those types of people have misunderstood karma and misunderstood like how it comes back to them and also misunderstood what they think is their power. I still really believe that true free will exists and that as maybe like fucked up as it sounds... <laughs> The only people they can really hurt are those who agree to it. Which is uh, like so, most people. Yeah, which is most people. 
And genuinely because I think they don't think they have a choice. And that's like maybe one of the greatest tricks ever played. Right, exactly. Because how can you even call that free will if, you, if you've if you agreed to it subconsciously or some soul agreement that you don't even know about? Well, you, you have it. Well, yeah, that part of it. But I mean, I look at that part of it as just being if you're just not paying attention to your life and you're just watching TV all the time and you're that you're responsible for that. You know, at the end of the day, it's like uh, it's like the Bible quote. For he who has more will be given. Uh-huh. And those he who hasn't will lose everything. You know, it's just like yeah. the poor get poor and the rich get richer. Or it's, you know, the, that'd be the exasperation of it. But hmm. Or it's like it's like the abused woman, too, right? Like she doesn't leave sometimes because she thinks she can't. Or she thinks she doesn't deserve to. And she can. And she does deserve to. But if she thinks she doesn't, no one has to force her to stay. She's just going to choose to. And I feel like it's like that, too. If you don't know you can choose otherwise, you don't know how powerful you are, then you're going to let these psychopathic freaks run your world. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to, <laughs> but I yeah. guess that's what we're doing here. <laughs> it's easier, though, I guess, than not at first, probably. I think that's true. It's I, Yeah, it seems that way. I, I guess I'm thinking more of people that have trouble with demonic encounters or incubus succubus, people that have supernatural encounters that they don't agree with, they don't, they don't want, they think they've healed, they think they've dealt with, then that doesn't seem like free will to me. Like, it's not... Like, it's not like somebody's controlling them and they're in this power position in politics or something and they're, you know, controlling mm. people that way. They just they just can't properly heal because of these supernatural events. Like, how yeah. is that, you know, how do they have free will against that? Maybe it's subconscious on some level. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had a, you know, what I still call a demonic attachment when I was young. And that's part of what really like springboarded me into the spiritual and the understanding of really how fucking crazy everything is here (laughs) or how crazy it can be. Um, But even that I look back at and I wonder, uh, because I was into some pretty heavy drugs, you know, and I was in (laughs) definitely hanging out with like some, the wrong people who later tortured and murdered one of my friends. Oh my God. Yeah, like really dark, dark shit. So, I mean, and in my head, I was like, well, I'm not doing that stuff. I'm just getting high. Like, they're the crazy ones. Uh, And not, I mean, once I knew they murdered people, I didn't hang out with these people anymore. But that's not true for one of them, because I thought maybe he was like coerced into it or tricked into it. And then later I realized that was a bullshit excuse that I told myself to. (laughs) There's a lot of rationalization and justification (laughs) that goes on. A lot. Yeah, (laughs) they're hanging out with murderers. (laughs) Right. Well, so, uh, so maybe I did call that onto myself. Right. And, and literally I actually called it onto myself, which I didn't know I was doing at the time. So you may argue like, that's not fair. She didn't know, but I literally said, um, and I'm using this as an example now and not actually saying it or intending it. And the universe knows that my heart knows that, but I said, well, any, any spirit guide this reading, my first spirit, uh, my first tarot reading I ever did. So when you just call in any spirit to do a magical thing with you or like a spiritual thing with you, that's so stupid. How ignorant, naive, like, but I didn't know. Um, and uh, so I, I literally called it to me. And then I also had these like dark uh, energies around me. I had these dark agreements I didn't really mean to make, but I did make them. So yeah, I see part of it is like, it's not really fair. And I see another part of it is like, I did that. I can't deny that. Like I did literally call it onto myself. So was that while you were using like, or not while, not, not like, but in that time period, kind of like, were you, were you interested in all this while you were in that, in the drugs? Yeah. I just went back and forth between like fake sobriety and drug use a lot for many years. (laughs) It's like, Oh, I'm sober for a week. I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm not sober actually, but I am now again for three days. I'm like, no, okay. I'm not. But, um, so I definitely was the whole time, uh, in that specific first tarot reading ever i was at a sober sleepover so (laughs) even the sober kids can get you into some shit no one else there got a demonic attachment as far as i know and they all did the same thing um but i also you know have had always had sort of connections and weird things and stuff and i just think some of us have like a bigger portal or whatever you want to call it and so i think that thing was like "Ooh, money shot like let's get this 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, lots that makes of, sense. Lots yeah. of energy to yeah. feed off of. And then you just realized at one point, I think I heard this part of your story too, is you realized at one point you just didn't want to do that anymore and you decided not to. And you drugs put that intent. In yeah, or, drugs. Yeah, yeah. The hard drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Put it was that maybe intention piece there. by piece. Yeah. Cause I, I quit uh, meth first. No, actually I think I quit acid first and then meth and then eventually even uh, weed and then eventually even alcohol. I like don't do anything now. Yeah. I, I have caffeine. <laughs> it's my drug. Yeah, I I did I had to drop it all at once. I couldn't do it in stages like that because I couldn't even go a few days at one point. It was just yeah. Yikes! I had sort of quit and then stopped quitting before the ne- that night was over. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, tomorrow's I'm quitting, and then that night I'd be like, nope, getting more for tomorrow too. Yeah, it was pretty bad. My favorite was when I was like, okay, I'm quitting smoking, but if I'm drinking, I can still have one. Like that's not a big deal. So then I just started drinking all day, every day so that I could smoke all the time. <laughs> like, right. Exactly. That's some good logic. That's that rationalization I was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I used to get better abs- to be an alcoholic or a smoker. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so how long, how long did you, so you were interested in all that stuff while you were teaching. So this goes way back. So that was, so was that before your teaching? Like when you went through this, this, uh, like this dark attachment and the, the drugs, all, that was before teaching? Yes. Yeah. 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 And most of my random uh, encounters with shamanic teachers and healers, which I never asked for, but just tended to get over and over again, was all throughout my teaching career. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of why you quit, I guess. Teaching? Yeah. No, I literally quit because adults are such horrible, horrible humans, and that system is so sick. Like, they were, like, attacking me. So I had my 14 year career, I'm a very organized person. Um, and I keep meticulous records and I never have lost a single record. This is just an example. My last year teaching I always locked my classroom. I know where everything is, et cetera, et cetera. Literally my last year teaching never lost a record. I came in one day and I, very obviously many of my records were just gone. And I was like, well, that's not possible. It's very strange. So I sent out an email. I was like, Hey, did anybody come into my room? And I don't know, borrow this, 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 and this record that I've been keeping. Uh, no, we have no idea what you're talking about. You're crazy. Then that day was, a, a meeting was called where I had to suddenly produce exactly those records. So luckily I had a record of saying someone came in and stole those records before the meeting was called. So I could show like, how could I have known that, you know, but clearly somebody was like trying to sabotage me and get me uh, like some dings on my record so I could eventually be fired or whatever. And that same year, another man came into my room one day, one morning, shut the door behind him, which locks the door, by the way. So now I'm in a locked room with a man one on one. And he comes over to me. I'm in the far corner on the opposite side of the door. All of this is so completely unacceptable. He comes over, he's angry and he starts yelling at me. And he's like, you, you don't, you just need to quit teaching and never come back here. Why are you even here? What? He's like, you don't even care about the kids. I'm like, I'm here every day. I care deeply. I do a great job. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. We disagree about discipline, basically, is what it comes down to. And he thinks that means I don't care about kids and that he gets to yell at me about it. And then he yells and yells and yells. And I just say, you need to leave my room, please. This isn't appropriate at all. We can talk when you've calmed down. And finally, he leaves. And like, that happened. Uh, both of those things happen. And those are just two of like 20 things that happened in my last year. And I'm like, I could deal with anything from kids, but I cannot deal with this shit. Like you guys have mental issues. You literally need severe therapy. I realize if they heard me talking about orbs and, you know, shamans and demons, they probably think I need therapy, but literally they're like codependent, narcissistic cluster B personality disorder people. And like, this is who's teaching our children. <laughs> what I mean, do you, do you ever think about what it would be like to, if you were teaching during COVID with all the masks and all that crazy shit? I mean, how would you even dealt with that? I'm sure you wouldn't have put up with that. No, <laughs> like how fucking lucky though. I left literally the year before it all came down. So I, I just trusted my gut. I literally got just told basically that I have to just quit teaching and I knew it for years. And so it wasn't surprising. And, um, I had learned to follow, you know, my guidance or my intuition and my signs and synchronicities. And so I, I did it. And then the next year that happened and it would have been a nightmare for them and for me, because I would have sued and I wouldn't have let go. And it probably would have gotten drawn out over years 
And I'd be stressed out, old, gray-haired woman and bitter and angry. So I'm really glad I didn't have to deal with any of that uh, because I absolutely wouldn't have put up with any of it. And now, so you've you've written an, another book. You've written a few books too, and you do your tarot on on your YouTube channel and all that. Do you want to? Can you explain a little bit about how the channeling your books work, and maybe about your book? Yeah, I really resisted the term channeling. I yeah. still hate it. Yeah, I still I still hate half the things I talk about because I really was the rational person who thought all of this was just garbage done by psychos who want to make money. And I was literally just like forced into it over my life in those various ways that we've sort of mentioned here. And, uh, but I had to recognize that I was doing what might be called channeling with my first book, which was sign curve of ants. It's actually not my first book, but it's my first nonfiction and, and channeled book. And I, uh, received it as like what people call a download, which I hate hearing myself say out loud, but is actually what it is. <laughs> I know this. It's hard to, it's hard. It's really hard to talk about this stuff without using all these buzzwords. I know. I wish I had different terminology, but then no one would know what I meant anyway. So it, it did happen like that came into my head. I had to scramble to get some notes down. And then the next day I sat down to start writing it. And I had no idea how to write a novel. I definitely had read novels my whole life. So I had that kind of experience. I wasn't like blind, uh, and I'm an English and literature major and teacher. So I really like, I have a good background, but I just have never written fiction and never thought I could. Uh, and I sat down to write it without any plan really, except that like chunk that had fallen into my brain of like the general outline of the story and things would just appear in my head, like a movie. I would just see it, you know, playing out. I would say, okay, Here's this character. The name would just pop into my head. What they were going to say to each other would come into my head. And I would just start writing it. And I was like, wow, my imagination is great. I didn't know I was so good at this. Um, I'm not saying I'm like so good. You can go read the book and decide for yourself. But I just didn't know it was going to be that easy. So this happened to me for the whole book. I would just get chunks and chapters and I would jump around in the timeline. And then eventually I had this whole book. And then I started noticing that things in the book apparently were real. And that started blowing my mind. And one of the things that I talk about that was my biggest, like, wow, this is, how did, how did this happen? I couldn't have known this, um, was that this being appears and he sort of is in the, uh, he's like a guide, right? He's like a spiritual guardian or whatever. I don't really classify him. He just kind of comes out and he starts guiding one of these young girls in the story. And um, he has horns and he has very masculine energy and he's there to help the cycles turn uh, easily and the ages change. Um, and he's there for rebirth and all of these things, all of these energies. And it was all like in the text around him. Um, but he didn't have a name or anything. And then I, uh, was just randomly, I don't know, looking somewhere and on online or something. And this image popped up and it looked exactly like I saw him in my mind. And I was like, Holy shit, someone, all someone else has seen this like being or whatever. I thought it was just a made up guy in my book. And I look and he has a name and it's Ser Nunos, which is a Celtic um, sort of God. And it's just kind of like the green man. And I start reading all his qualities and it's like exactly the qualities he has in the story. And I'm like, what the fuck though? Like, <laughs> so, I mean, it's archetypal and, you know, Jung would say this is in our collective unconscious and this is how it manifests. And, and it represents those things because that type of imagery represents that to us. And that makes sense to me. That doesn't make it unreal. It makes it more real to me, you know, like psychology confirms it and our cultures confirm it. And then here he is popping up in stories too. So I'm like, well, this guy clearly exists and he clearly wanted to be a part of this story or already was. And I just received it and channeled it out. So I wasn't like, oh, this is totally channeling. But I was like, that is pretty weird that like stuff appeared in this book that I wouldn't have known. Another one was the concept of the quaternity. I don't even think I'd ever heard that word before. It popped into my head. I used it. And the way I used it is apparently like how it's used. Uh, I thought I made it up. Nope, it's a real thing. And there's a lot of those examples in that book. So I'm like, well, this, okay. So it downloaded, it played in my head like a movie and I wrote it out and a bunch of it is actually real. It's a little bit like channeling. So then I start, uh, you know, my show Rogue Ways shortly thereafter, a couple of years later, I think. And at the end of Rogue Ways episodes and Rogue Ways is unscripted, just like your show is. You have an idea. Oh, we're going to have Lindsay on. We'll probably talk about some of these things, but you don't really know like where the conversation's going to go. Me too. I don't know for sure. But I write the ending out ahead of time 
just to like have a closing, you know, I'm an English teacher. You got to have a conclusion. Uh, So I have this little ending that I write out ahead of time. And I started noticing that every time with at least the vast majority of times, the ending would like perfectly summarize everything we talked about. Even when what we talked about was like, shouldn't have necessarily even been a part of the conversation if you were going to guess what we were going to talk about. So I was like, that's pretty weird too. And then people started telling me, oh, we love your endings. You know, you should uh, like share them with us somehow. And I was like, that's actually a good idea. So I made this book called All Endings Are Beginnings. Well, then people started using it like an oracle. They would ask it a question, they would open it and they would tell them the answer. And they started sending me examples of like how... <laughs> really crazy and uncanny the answers were. So I started doing it. I was like, let's see. I started asking it questions every time it answers it. And it's like, not just that vague, like it could answer anything. They're like really specific to your question answers. And I'm like, I couldn't have done that if I tried. So maybe this is a type of channeling too. Finally, I'm driving along sometime last fall, I think. And my phone pops up a reminder. All of my reminders are always popping up on my phone because they're like, I just can't remember things. And so it tells me everything. It's like, don't forget to water the lawn and go to the post office today and buy food for yourself and everything. Like I just need it to do that. So a reminder pops up, which is not um, abnormal, but this one says, consider writing the key of transformational healing. And I'm like, well, okay. (laughs) Like, I don't remember putting this reminder into myself at all. I have no recollection of that. I get that my memory is not perfect, but when it popped up, I'd be like, oh yeah, that, right? Like that's how memory works at least. And no, I have no memory of this. I don't know how or who or what put this in my phone. So I'm like, I, I'm like, okay, I'm taking it. Like, this is how it goes for me. Like shit, weird shit happens. And it puts me in the right place at the right time. And it heads me the right direction. So I'm like, maybe I'm supposed to write a book called the key of transformational healing. So I sat down. I titled the page, The Key of Transformational Healing, and I just got really still and I went inside to my little meditational space and I was like, what, what, what is it supposed to be about? And it just, and this is actual channeling. Wow. Yeah. And, and so the whole book is that it's me going into that space and seeing what came out. And, um, it's pretty rad. If I do say so myself, it's a pretty cool book, actually. It's very short too, which I always like to point out for people who, aren't big readers, but want like a hefty dose of profound channeled stuff. And I swear to you, I hate channelers. I hate people who call themselves channelers, but here I did and I did it. So I have to just own it. Well, I mean, Darren, we, Darren and I were just bra- briefly discussing it beforehand. Cause I kind of think I did the same thing in a way, but it's only because I like, usually I'm not very channel or I, vis- I can't even visualize things really. I just feel yeah. physical sensations, but, but I wanted to write a book on intentional recovery, like addiction That's recovery. Right. And, and what happened to me was I was trying to sleep. Like I had some vague ideas and stuff, but I couldn't go to sleep a couple nights. Cause it was like just, it was just r- rolling around in my head and I had to get up and write the stuff down. So the, the, the majority of the book was written just in a couple sessions where that, where that kind of happened, where it yeah. was just like flooding in and I kind of had to just get it all down. And it was kind of based on, yeah, not my story, but which I ended up doing later, but the majority of like the concept of like, it was basic based on like Lynn McTaggart's power of eight yeah. and intentions and alchemical meditations, like bringing in, learning how to bring in the bad sort of memories and energies and transmuting them into positive ones through your centers of your body. Um, that's rad. So, that's exactly what all healing is. So I love that. Right on. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's a powerful kind of meditation practice. So I wanted to make that an, into like a group, almost like a program, but not, not that it's, it's, you know, it hasn't been started or anything like that. But then I had a pro- hard time just finishing off the book, like, get you know, kind of started to get question it and, and get like, you know, funny now, now it's kind of been edited. So I got to fit, I, I still have to finish it off. Yeah. But it felt like I was I was sort of getting that inspiration. I wouldn't even really call it a download, but just a flood of inspiration that I had to kind of get down. Well, that's and then like you bitched out. That's the thing. And then you... I, I'm not, I haven't stopped yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I even, sent, like I even sent. Gar, I even sent Neil Gar. I sent Neil Gar. I redid Gar. the sound. I, I redid the sound uh, <laughs> vibration experience I had, and I redid that. I made it longer, and I sent it to him. Yeah. And I'll include that in the book and. You know, the, the didgeridoo popping the root shocker, you know, that whole pop, experience. Popping pop my shockers. 
Literally. <laughs> so I Graham, mean, Graham literally got his his root chakra popped. When I did. 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 I did. Dude. Literally. <laughs> that sounds like rape. I don't know. I, okay. <laughs> this is what I did. We do rape. It's fucked up. <laughs> it's shamanic rape. Yeah. No, it helped. It was the, it transformed the, the whole Kundalini thing got don't. going. <laughs> did we do? If the root is blocked, okay, and consider this. How many people do you know that don't have, even if you don't know what root is or whatever, how many people do you know that don't have any sexual trauma or any issues with security, whether it's food or their body or like, you know, literal safety or anything? I don't know. Almost anyone. Everybody's been traumatized in that way. I feel like they, the elusive they, do this for a reason. Because if your root's blocked, like you're not going to, you're not going to get yourself whole. Right. Right. So that, I mean, that anyway, so, I mean, I have, you know, I, I have been working on it still. I'm going to, I'm going to finish it off. I I think I need to finish it off. It's just, I, you know, I run into, uh, yeah. Just, what did you call it? Bitching out? You bitched out. I mean, you always want to bitch out. That's it. That's just, I mean, that's what keeps most of these people on the couch is just, I mean, they all, they're not all just like NPCs. They have these moments of inspiration. They're all probably, gonna i mean maybe it's not even as big as writing a book they're just gonna build a new shelf in the basement and organize that but that could just lead to something else because they they got a knack for building shelves or some shit but uh you know it's just like on the higher level it's like you know i'm always trying to talk myself out of events trying to talk yourself out maybe we should just cancel this one it hasn't sold enough tickets yet you know you just everyone's that's just the nature of the beast that's that dude you're always going to be fucking wrestling with you're, you're your own worst enemy and i think in my in my head i thought you know this actually might be a, a recovery program like i should start a meeting i should start the whole program up and i kind of got ahead of myself and now i need to backtrack off and and not make the book about that just as a, as an idea more of an idea not sort of i had it sort of outlined as almost like a program but yeah. it's not there yet, right? But I mean, but I want to throw it out there for inspiration and for ideas for people because it's all about thoughts and intention. It's like what you talked about when you, you stopped using meth. I mean, it's like I had a couple moments of clarity where I knew, like I thought I could get better. And that was all, that was the seed that started the whole thing. Yeah. I was just like, well, I don't want to live like this anymore. So it's either death or living like this. Yeah. And I'm going to do neither of those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's what I I have this whole thing with, um, you know, is it a muse? Is it a, is it your higher self? Is it literally some other spiritual entity or something that's like feeding it to you? Is it all of the above? I don't know. I don't really care. People are really attached to like definitions and like putting things in boxes. And I'm like, I don't care. I just know what works for me. I know what makes me heal, what makes me happy and what helps me heal others or help others to heal themselves. And we don't need, I don't need too many uh, attachments for that to, to do well. But I love this story. I heard once this woman was, and I don't remember who it was, but she was a writer and she was on some really normie podcast that I started with way back in like 2005 or some whatever podcasts were new. And um, so it was probably on NPR or something. And she was talking about writing and she was like, you know, the characters actually come and they, they talk to you and they're real. They're real. They're just not in this dimension. And even the idea of your book, like it's floating around in the, in the ether. And, and if it comes to you, you're blessed and you better channel that through and create it. And I was like, this woman's schizophrenic. Like, <laughs> Like, she's crazy. Um, but I was also like, maybe it is like that. I don't know. And then when I was writing Sign Curve, that first book, that is how it felt. I was like, these are real. I don't fucking know these people. Like, they're the ones coming to me and showing me what they're doing. Like, I'm not making any of this up. They're just showing it to me. So something about it is real, whatever we, we think reality is. Um, yeah, and then I wonder too, like, did that all happen? Because it's set in the distant, distant golden age of a past. Maybe this is actually what happened to them. I yeah, don't know, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah, and it's different when you when you're going into the intention of doing a book and you're trying to use your imagination to create the stuff. It's totally different than just totally. going to a still space and downloading all this. Like you, you know, you mentioned before. Oh, I had a, have a, the greatest imagination, but it's not really your imagination. It's your greatest reception or receptor or something. You're actually enabling yourself to translate that into words. You know. Instead yeah. of creating it from scratch, you're, you're taking when it. When I imagine it and do it, it's crap. <laughs> it's contrived and it's boring yeah, and it's stupid. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. So I, that's why I say people are like, oh, you did a great job writing this book. I'm like, thanks. I don't really feel like I did though. 
I obviously did the typing and the editing and stuff. Right. But like, I don't know. I don't know if I wrote it. I don't know if you could call it that. Gordon White has a great example in his in his newest book called Animistic. And he's talking about the uh, uh, so I don't know any. I can't remember any of the like technical names of this tribe or this guy and, and the, the name of the hut and all this. But he's he's there's an old like they used to do mounds. And they used to. So they dig out these holes. Right. And mm-hmm. they'd build a, a dome over top and they'd, it'd be like a mound over top. And that would be their shelter. They'd go in and do that. Very similar to I think it seems similar to the mounds all over like the world. The North America in, and, uh, in uh, Mesa Verde. Uh, no, because even more dug under. right? Yeah. Like yeah. a tunnel almost. Yeah. Like it's both. It's got both. It's got a, a dug under and over top. But anyways, this. So this this indigenous guy was trying to figure out how to, and it's about, about the, the environment and the landscape and how our perception of all that is all fucked up. Right. It's, it's like, we're, we're all, we're separating ourselves from all this stuff. Even a landscape that looks beautiful to us has been completely destroyed according to what we think nature should be or whatever, but we're, we're, we're conditioning ourselves to be separate from all this. And he was trying to figure out how to, Rev, rev, uh, either revere this thing or restore it or what to do with this, with this mound. And he sat there every night for like six months trying to just be still and listen to his, his, the ancestors or his, you know, the, whatever comes to him. And he was instructed to build a whole new one, to construct a whole new one. And they go, he goes through the the whole story of that, but it's, it's, that's almost like what we're talking about. Yeah. Like he, he, he went there with the intention to just listen to whatever comes to him. And, and it was like Gaia or nature or his ancestors or something was telling him, you know, how to, how to rebuild this. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. That's really cool. Well, this is like now part of my regular life every day where random entities and energies will share things with me. Cause now when people, and I didn't intend to do this either, but I started offering what I called guidance sessions to people. And I, I meant for it kind of to be like, you know, a lot of us when we're, especially when I was first encountering all this stuff, I was like, well, I'm insane. And so I guess I'll be insane for the rest of my life. Like this can't be real. And if I had someone who had similar experiences or like the shamanic teachers that I got thrust into contact with later on accident or any of that, it would have been so much easier. And so I meant for it to be like, Hey, if you've got weird experiences or just stuff, you don't, you're not sure how to like integrate it in your life. Like let's chat. It can just be a one-on-one conversation but people started coming to me and being like, Hey, can you tell me what my guides think about this? And I'm like, I don't know, let's try. And now that's like all anybody does. And so I go in and I get all of these messages. And so isn't that channeling in a way too? So so I'm like, despite myself, I have become a channel and, uh, and now that's just what I am. But I, I, as much as I'm kind of making fun of it, I do deeply revere it. It's a great honor and it's very humbling. Um, and so I, I respect it deeply. And I, I know anyone who kind of has those experiences would also, um, so I do make fun of it, but I, I do respect it. What, what are some of the key, key things that came through on your book? Uh, the key of transformational healing. (laughs) Um, there's so much, you know, what I love about it the most is that it really affirms that people are already doing so many people right now, specifically, they're like, look, I know this is like the end time or whatever. And it's supposed to be a great transition or you know, the rainbow bridge to the future where everybody has like different names for it and different ideas of what to call it. But so many people are like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? And I love that in this book, it really affirms like, you have already been doing it, actually. <laughs> it's not an out. It's not like, yeah, go back to the couch, you're, you know, play more games, although that's cool too. It's just saying like, you've already, your whole life has been leading you to whatever it is you're supposed to do. And you've already been doing it. And if you want to do it more clearly, more intentionally, then the key to that is healing. So it's not telling you really like how to heal. It's explaining to you how healing yourself is literally the key to transformation. And people come, you know, I have a this course I do. It's a six-week course to help people unlock their own spiritual gifts, channels, connections, whatever they want to call it, no matter what tradition they're from. And 
uh, that's part of what we focus on too. And people really underestimate themselves and they, and they overestimate all these weird tricks and like books and like grimoires or whatever things they think you maybe have to study deeply and like get a doctorate in, in order to be spiritually connected. And it, and you really don't. The truth is that all you really have to do is go within, become still and know that you are that. And then, you know, you might have to heal a lot because when you do go into that stillness and and connect lots of times, that's the first time you've given yourself that time. And your body's like, Oh, good God. Thanks here. Deal with this. We've been holding this for way too long. (laughs) So people go in and get still and they'll just cry. Yeah. Or they'll get really angry all of a sudden, or like just shit will come up because we've been holding on to it. We're all traumatized as fuck. And like most of us haven't dealt with most of it. So you do have to release all of that. And it really is like you, it's in your, it's in your auric or your spiritual body. If you believe in that, your energy body or your, or it's in your body, body, your physical body is holding on to trauma. And, and this is what a lot of our pains and illnesses manifest as. And sure. It's also because like your arteries clogged or whatever, but your arteries clogged because your emotional shit is fucked up and you haven't healed that. There's this great book by Dr. Thomas Cowan. And this was actually the first interview I did with him before all the COVID stuff. And it's his book, Cosmic Heart, Human Heart, I think is what it's called. And he talks about that. He's like, there's all this evidence actually that our heart disease is our emotional disease. It's documented, like, you know, and and we see people who heal emotionally, like heal their heart disease too. And so that happens all over your body. So your body's holding it, your mental body and your mental disturbances or your mental illnesses. Those are also the shit you really need to like deal with whole release and heal. It's all your bodies are holding this. So you do often release that when you start sort of going in and becoming more still. And that's part of what happens, but it's a good thing, even though it sucks to go through because it, when it releases, you're way more deeply connected and present. Uh, and then you're, whatever your spiritual gifts are, are much more obvious, even though you really have always been doing them, whatever they are. Everyone. Even just being still is hard. I mean, my friend used to do a still in this meditation every morning. He'd do like 20, 30 minutes of stillness meditation. So just hit the snooze button. Yeah, that's a stillness meditation. (laughs) That's my my stillness meditation. I do a stillness meditation too. 15 minutes, fuck this. Roll over over and cuddle the cat for a minute. 15 minutes on the left, 15 minutes on the right. But he used that, to just sit I there. I want your meditation book. That's he he used to just sit there and and not move, like not. You can't twitch. You can't do anything. Like it's <laughs> as still as possible. And man, that is tough to do. It is tough to do. Do you have any? Do you have any like advice for people on how to become relaxed and still? I mean, even just yeah. even just letting all the tension out of your body is difficult for yes. the first few times. Just becoming still physically. Oh yeah, very difficult. Well, one thing I love to share with people is that it is a big, huge fat lie that you have to stop your thoughts. And so if you're trying to stop your thoughts, like have fun, I guess, good luck, but that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, if it, this is what I say to people, it could be a side effect. Well, if you, if you watch them, they slow down. I mean, that's, you know, yes. you, you don't have to stop them, but watch them and they'll slow down. The gaps keep, between them will increase and, and keep yeah. doing it. And you might have the moment you might have the experience I've had it and it's fucking world shattering. So like when you actually have no thoughts and you step back from yourself and it's like, you're seeing yourself from some other level of consciousness that doesn't even really feel like you, but you know, it is you, but also there's you in front of you and that's a different you. And this is like a bigger you that's less identified with anything in this reality. And it is the most, that's as best as I can describe it. And it's the most bizarre and awesome, liberating experience, but that cannot be your goal. You can't just jump to that. Like I'm going to have no thoughts. I'm going to have no thoughts. Like that's not how you get there but it is a side effect. So, um, that's the first thing, just get rid of it. Right. Um, and the other thing is there's so many millions and billions and trillions of meditations. So people will be like, Oh, meditation is this. Well, that is one form. Right. But really what I love the most, I put one hand on my belly, right below my belly button. This is our spiritual fuel tank. I put one hand on my heart. <laughs> yeah, you, you got tap it. And, tap <laughs> pat and, your head. <laughs> pat your head and roll, roll around your belly. <laughs> I still can't do that. And put your hand on your heart. This is your this is your super portal. This is like the where heaven meets earth, the middle of your spiritual body, your energetic body, your physical body. So now you've got your hand on your two like really powerful energy centers. 
breathe deep through your nose. And if you do have tension and stress and high energy, which sometimes I do when I come to this, I'm like, oh, like I'm stressing. And so I go and I blow really hard. And I breathe deep and long and slow. And you fill up your belly, not your chest, right? Buddha belly breaths instead of your chest breaths. And then, and I do that a couple of times until I'm kind of like, oh, okay, some of the energy has gone. Then I go into just relaxed, easier breathing. I just watch my breath, right? I'm just like, yep, there's my breath. It's coming in. My belly's expanding. It's going out. My belly's coming back in. It's going in. And if you add to that, just eyes closed. And when you close your eyes, your attention immediately comes into your body. That combination of your attention within yourself, slow, deep breaths, filling your Buddha belly and a hand on a heart, hand on your lower abdomen, just that. If you did just that for like five minutes a day, that would already lower your heart rate, lower your blood pressure, like bring your brain waves into a neutral state, like all kinds of good stuff for you um, and bring your spiritual awareness more deep. Nice. That's a great tip. Yeah, that's good. Where can uh, where can our listeners find all your books? All of them are available on my site at rogueways.org, as well as all the other services I provide and the fun things I do there. I've got lots of handy dandy orgone, which is another thing I hate hearing myself. <laughs> I was never going to make orgone, and now I make it all the time. Wait, what's and, that? Uh, is that the uh, little crystals that stop the waves, like that it, pyramid I have upstairs? Like I don't think it's a pyramid full stops. of a bunch of stuff. So like yes. bits of copper and all sorts of stuff in there. That's Oregon, yes. And I don't I don't think it stops EMF. No. I if you look at um uh EMF readings around it, they might change a little bit, but it's not actually like stopping them from it might be stopping them right there. It's what not do they stopping do them like around you. Um but what? uh Oregon is the it's just another word for the life force, right? It's prana, it's chi. And so um, these are just meant to accumulate prana, chi, life force, just like your body does all the time naturally. So it's like an extra dose and you can give it your intention. You know, my intention is that I, I don't know, stop smoking or uh, that I do meditation better and more deeply um, or that I bring more love into my life or that I release anger or whatever. And some of them are better at others, the ones I make at least, because some of them have the crystals and the flowers that like to do that thing that is your intention for it. So they're all accumulating life force that you can do anything with, but some of them are better at other things because the stuff in it that's making the orgone is uh, already doing its own thing in the world, right? That's its energy. So that's that's what I think orgone is for. Lots of people disagree with me and don't like what I'm doing. And I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's what, just like cast in resin or something. Yep. Mine is cast in resin. Some people use beeswax and um, I think some people use glass, but that's like hardcore. That I is would, hardcore. I'm going to cool. go on a class next winter to make a bong though. That would be cool. That would be a better use of glass. That bong too. That's or weed is Oregon accumulating too. So all life is Oregon really Oregon well, fucking magnet over here. I, th- I thought, I thought I heard you mention something about Brown's gas. Oh yeah. The other day. Do you have that, that machine? From, you still uh, use that thing? Well, I got, I need to clean mine out. Then yeah. wasn't that thing like $3,000? No, it was almost. You think, yeah, think there's expensive. a used market for it? <laughs> it's pretty expensive. Maybe you could trade it to the dentist. I need the dentist to be <laughs> it. Hey, man, you ever hear this brown water? <laughs> I got a machine. I'll trade it for a root canal. <laughs> It'll change your life, man. It'll it's very change gone. your life, man. And I got uh, some cocaine, too. Maybe I should start. I mean, maybe I need to drink more. Maybe Maybe the lesson is to clean that machine and drink more of it, more from from it, and then maybe that'll drink, help. Maybe that'll help my tooth infection. I drink two of these every single day of it, if not Water, more, and I breathe that. through it for a minimum of two hours a day. So you do lots of it, then? I eh? see. I don't think I was doing enough of it. Like, do you, do you think that people like that have serious conditions need to do a lot of it? Because the guy that that sold me the machine, I called him later on because his aunt had MS and she was really getting better from it. And uh, my girlfriend's ex has MS really bad and it started to help him move his arm up, but I don't think he does it enough. And what this guy told me was if you breathe it for like, let's say a half hour, it, that increases your, your uh, nitrogen, right? Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen levels for a half hour. 
Like it, it, it's it's uh, sort of half life is the same amount that you've been putting in it. So if you're if you're doing it for two hours, your hydrogen levels will stay up for four hours. Two while you're doing it, and two afterwards. So I I think it it's you know for somebody like that, they probably got to breathe it quite a bit to keep their levels high enough to heal, you know, or drink a lot of the water. I mean, I was only drinking like a glass of it and I try not to do it at night because it would keep me, it would keep me up. Remember I tastes brought Darren, weird. it tastes, but well, that was probably because I was using uh distilled water at the time. I stopped using distilled water for the, the drinking. Do you drink the, do you, do you, what do you, do you use distilled to drink? Yeah, I actually yeah. got a distiller so that I. Oh, did you? Did you get? Yeah. Did you get? Can I make uh, my coffee with this water? I've did, been thinking about making yes. my coffee with bone broth. Oh, Ooh. yeah, that's a good idea. That'd be wild. I'm I don't know. I make, we make rice that. with bone broth. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. But did you get Gary Ellis's uh, water machine? No, I got George Wiseman's. George Wiseman's. Oh, yeah. he he's got a distiller too. He also has a distiller. No, oh, I didn't know that. He's got so, the yeah. Brown's gas thing. Okay. So I, George... got the, I got the machine and then I got the distiller so I could make the distilled water instead of buying all those. Yeah, yeah. All the no, time. that's oh. good. Yeah. And, and I thought you were right only supposed now. to do it like 20 minutes a day, three times a day. So when he told me he came on Rogue Ways and, and he's like, oh, no, do it as much as you can. Do it all day. Sleep with it if you can. Yeah, like, I yeah. was like, oh, wild. Yeah, okay. I think he, I think he, he kind of ruined, he didn't ruin the message, but. That's what I got from his original message as well. But I think he yeah. was saying just start off like really slow and build yourself up. Um, so you but when I brought you that water, you, you were you were uh, you, you were still awake. Like he, he said, it did it did keep you awake that night. Yeah, you can sleep with it. Yeah, you can hook it up and uh, mind it you, it only goes for like anymore. an hour. It only goes I'm for like, an hour though. I'm like uh, a, a, a a acclimated to it now because I I can sleep after using it no problem. But at first it was like wired and so what he was talking about too is that you're um oh i totally forgot what i was gonna say oh, what did you say right before that about the distilling um anyway i know. was gonna because i was gonna t tell you about gary ellis's water machine i bought water from his distiller because he distilled it a hundred times like he said wow. his was the i think it's gary ellis no that doesn't sound right fuck now i'm i can't remember now but i i should get it right because it's, it's important names. anyways and it's and it tasted super wet like but they said that was the purest water on earth like they had wow. used it in mexican hospitals and healed a bunch of people like this was like goes through a distillery and you could buy a machine for three grand i think but you, it goes through a whole um, well i distillery. suffered greatly from hashimoto's and it's an autoimmune disorder and it is a horrifying i mean it's not as bad as like lupus and ms i get that it's like not as bad, but it's pretty bad. Like any random thing can just like take me out for three days and I won't walk or move and I'll just cry. Like it's just a nightmare. And, uh, and it's random. You never know like what it's going to be this time or why it's going to happen. And, um, plus in general, my energy levels over time were just going down. My clarity was going down. I'm not I, the, even the level of clarity I have talking to you right now is like way higher than it was even last year. Uh, and this is all Brown's gas. As far as I can tell, since I started doing it, I've had exceptional clarity, way more energy. It's not like this wired up energy either. It's just like, I can just do a lot. It's like microdosing all the time. <laughs> like I just yeah, time. I think this is, I'm glad we talked about this. It's going to get me motivated to clean the machine and start again with it. Yeah. Um, Cause I oh, wasn't. And I wanted to say yeah. about MS. Have you ever heard of the walls diet? Uh, no. Co What's it called? The wall? W A H L apostrophe S walls. And she is a doctor. She had MS and she was laid out like in the backward, like in the bed wheelchair where you're like laid completely back. She, that's how far she was. And she started doing this specific diet and she walks and talks and like jumps and runs like she's recovered. And that's supposed to be impossible. And it was literally just the diet that did it for her. And the essence of the diet is like probably 90% greens and vegetables and then like 10% meat. And that's all you eat. Wow. And you have liver once a week. And I'm really simplifying it, but that's basically what the diet is. And she did just that and drank just water and she recovered. Wow. That's so interesting. if you combined that with Brown's gas, like, I don't know. Yeah. Let's just, just um, summarize Brown's gas for people. Uh, and so they understand what it is, if you could, it's, or there's an electric current that's going through the water and the electric current is somehow creating a plasma <laughs> and the plasma is somehow then producing like a, 
plasmified gas. It's a gas, but there's like some different quality about it that I still can't really describe myself. Besides more hydrogen. Yeah. 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 That's the hydrogen rich gas and you're breathing it in and it's perfectly safe. Um, but it increases the hydrogen in your body and the water that you end up drinking is, a, what does he call it? Electrically expanded hydrogen molecules. So it's still water, but there's something about it that has a different structure and it has more hydrogen somehow. People are like, oh, hydrogen peroxide. No, the chemical structure is different. It's still water. I don't, and I can't explain it any better than that. <laughs> but yeah, because no, it's so good, hydrogen dude. rich in the gas and because it's so hydrogen rich in the water, your body can absorb all of that. And your body, our bodies are apparently all hydrogen deficient. And I don't know why, but it feels really good. <laughs> Right on, yeah. Thanks. I'll put links to the show notes and all, for all that stuff. And the and the waters, John John Ellis water is the one. I don't know if I said that. John uh, Ellis water. I feel yeah. like I just heard about this from the chemical free body guy. Have you guys talked to him? Yeah, yeah, we have. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe he mentioned it. Yeah, maybe. I think I might have mentioned it to him way back too. Um, maybe that's what happened. Yeah, it's really interesting. This. Uh, I want to. I want to get. Uh, I want to get one of John's machines eventually, but. You need, Is that you're the one have that two like brown water machines? No, that's the that's the hundred times distilling machine. That so you just have like a ten thousand dollar fucking water that, yeah. operate operation <laughs> yeah. in your kitchen, yeah. but you're just eating fucking Mister. No, no, I'm on a new. Time. I'm on the car. I'm back on the diet. I've lost five pounds in like nice. four, four days. Yeah, I'm back on the animal only diet. What I you just eating? started you today. My bastardized keto walls. I'm trying to eat mostly vegetables and meat and no carbs. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I today I had uh, bacon and eggs and uh, chicken and mm -hmm. cheese, yogurt. Is that's bacon it. is bacon cat? Yeah. What do you mean? It's a, it's a staple of that. Well, it's a staple for it. It's a staple. It's a staple. For it. It's a staple for it. it has to I'm be a staple. I'm on the bacon diet. If you, <laughs> I just cook bacon with all sorts of shit. <laughs> I make mayonnaise out of the grease. <laughs> <laughs> bacon is <laughs> I just can't lose weight <laughs> I just don't know what's wrong I No, what's it would, you would lose if you were on a bacon diet I'm telling you, you would lose You would, that's keto If you ate just yeah. bacon, it, I'm pretty sure it's the perfect keto ratio I think it's 80% fat and 20 protein Or whatever it's supposed to be It's, like, it's like fucking 6% Fucking sugar and nitrates That's true, you have to get uncured Unsugared well, I got, I got like, some, good, like some raw bacon from the From the Raw bacon's not bacon. Not, not. You know what I mean. It doesn't not, taste like bacon. <laughs> not, you know Where? what I mean. Bacon from the the farm. Oh, so you just yeah. got like cured bacon from the from the. You just got. It's just. Is that not bacon? It's then? still cured and nitrated and sugared. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's probably better than that. It's probably you know, better. Holy it has or it's, it doesn't have as many preservatives, but yeah, it's still yeah. preserved. Yeah. The pig was happier. Maybe the Hopefully, pig is yeah. happier, but the exactly. process is still a fucking yeah. easy. <laughs> Bacon is not the. That's the problem with bacon is like because you can't. You, you, I don't. I don't even. We don't eat bacon every day. We eat it probably you know three days a week, just because for that reason. Yeah. Because it's just full of all this other shit. Well, yeah. It's a dirty. It's a dirty. I, I mean, the it's ratio a dirty is preserve. perfect. It's a dirty. If preserve, you just had yeah. the raw bacon. But it wouldn't be delicious. It would just be like, <laughs> the fuck? Is it? It'd be like just like slicing up your pork belly into nice little thin slices and frying it in the pan, and you'd just be like, this is fucking terrible. But, uh, Dude, it was so weird. I tried to find pork belly. you can make a pork belly delicious. I mean, don't, Nobody don't, has don't. pork belly. Where do you even get it? I was like, what? Costco People don't eat usually, pork belly? <laughs> Costco usually always has pork belly. What? Yeah. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find it. That's, Someone's like, go to the Asian market. I'm like, why? Why? Costco's, Why does the Asian market have it, not the regular store? Costco's my go-to for pork belly. I have some I did in the not freezer know. right now because you have to buy such a big portion of it. But ah. it's delicious. I mean, there's your perfect ratio. Yeah, I it's love like pork belly. Eating vegans. That's where I'll go when the world goes to shit. I'll just start eating vegans. That's as close to uh, my venison now, it's like grass-fed pig. <laughs> Oh, I won't ask that actually. <laughs> I was going to ask if you have, an, have had a notorious vegan on your show. 
Notorious. You know how vegans are like. You, have to you know what? Vegan. We we Notorious haven't even got a lot of pushback E-E-G. from. We haven't even. Got I post a lot of pushback all my kills on social media, and we don't yeah, I got a little, got a little, we do get a little, little bit of hate sometimes. from that. Little, little bit of hate for the dead animals. Literally, yeah. Darren standing over them with his rifle. Like people tell me about how small my dick is. I just like, <laughs> what? all right, whatever. It's a weird time right now. The war on meat and all that. I mean, it is getting. It it almost makes me feel more comfortable getting into the all animal diet because there's a war against it, and soon they don't want us to eat that i mean i just saw something about uh the one of the wef things and they're talking about uh you've killed some shit now too not eating you have some business being a little bit into a carnivore diet now we'll get you killing your own shit and then i'd say yeah you got all sorts of business being a carnivore graham i'm not there yet to kill i'm not there yet i still have struggle i struggle with the you hold the consciousness part of it yeah yeah i know i know but it's it's, eat their uh, hearts but right. Paul Saladino, I want to have him on the show at some point because he wrote that book, The Carnivore Diet or whatever. And he goes through those meat. Remember the meat uh, about four or five years ago? All the problem meat causes cancer, red meat causes cancer. He actually goes in and deconstructs all that. And it blows you away how bad that was publicized and how wrong it all was. I mean, it's, it's I, all I always bullshit. thought that was all just like the lunch meats and shit anyway. No, they Probably. they talked about red meat and they yeah. yeah. I definitely well, don't think the it, lunch meats are good no, for you. Yeah, no, all that you no. know, the same that thing. That's like gross. eating bacon all the time. It's just like, yeah, man, I'm on fucking the best diet. I just eat black forest ham and bacon <laughs> and salami all fucking day <laughs> and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I cut the, cheese out. Not well, cut, they lied. I, I cut back on cheese. I had to cut back on cheese. It's That's a good so, thing to cut back on so too. Good, either though. way, it's no matter what your diet is. So uh, but they lied too about what clogs your arteries. They said it was meat. They said it was fat, and it's actually grains. Like my, all these studies are showing that it's actually the grains. Maybe it's the fat and the meat if you're also eating a lot of grains. <laughs> but if you cut the grains out, that's all going to clear itself up too. So what a bunch of fucking liars. Yeah. Oh. But I don't know if you were about to say that WAF guy that was talking about. Um, genetically modifying people without their knowledge so that they won't like meat anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. He's I think, fucking yeah. psychopath. He's like, yeah, I mean, we don't have to tell them and then they just won't want it and then we'll save the world. I'm like, I, all of you fuckers should die. That's total See, zombie. I don't apocalypse. have a problem with that. Let's just kill them. Eat the rich. There we go. Eat the rich. I don't know. The ve- <laughs> I'm telling you, the vegans are going to taste better. Especially if, you find nice, if you find a nice, lazy, chubby vegan. It'll be yeah. like Wagyu. <laughs> it's like Wagyu. Yeah. That's not a bad but call. But it'll be more porky, I guess. <laughs> Long pork. Long pork. Yeah, I really don't think I could ever eat a person. I could. It would be hard for me. I could definitely kill an animal and eat well, it. Oh, I watched it done when I was young. I grew up on a farm. It depends on the preparation. Are we going to tell you it's people? Do you know? You've probably, like, you've probably eaten people. At McDonald's, yeah. right? Isn't yet. that the thing? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, look at how much of this shit's coming. From last time I now. said that, Who Darren's like, knows? "Did you fact check that? Right. Are you, Darren? Are you spread misinformation?" Darren is a misinformation <laughs> fucking guru. This guy, just Dude, like, your Nazi like, meme was getting destroyed on Telegram. Where would you hear this? And he's just like, "Oh, you know, just it's going around, man. Everyone knows this." Just, <laughs> yeah. It's around, man. Just a going around, around. Yeah. This guy tried and then to tell sure me enough, a few I look years at it. And- when he first got on Instagram, this guy's telling me there's no fake news on Instagram. And it's just, <laughs> I didn't say no, there wasn't. You said that. That's what you I said. I don't think I That's said there's no. Said. I think I said there, it's, there's less than you would think. <laughs> <laughs> and and just, what I was trying to say is that there's a bunch of accounts that won't post. They can't post fake news because it gets because we have to be the people that are posting that stuff have to be more accurate with their stuff, right? We have, trust to be. Yeah, else does. we have to be. <laughs> These are the people that told me to trust the plan. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Still here. Trust harder. Trust harder. <laughs> He's coming back. He's coming I just back. met someone who had no idea. She was like, why are you banned from Facebook? I'm like, what? I mean, you want me to list the reasons or do you just want to know the offense this time? She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, you know, like there's people who are just banned more often for like nothing. Like they'll just pick something and be like, oh, you're banned. Uh, And that's me and a lot of us. And she like had no idea that this was a thing. I was like targeted banning shadow banning any of that stuff had no idea. Some people don't even No, they don't even know that there's censorship in general. They're like, well, prove to me there's censorship. I'm like, holy fuck, you don't think 
YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, all these main things are being censored. I mean, it's unbelievable I've that people, people are still me. in that. They don't even know their censorship. But I mean, then again, how yeah. are they going to know, right? Because they're not out looking for the information. That's insane, though. Yeah. yeah, you're right, though. They're not looking for it. And if you show it to them, they're like, that's Russian propaganda. I'm like, how convenient. <laughs> yeah, Everything Russia. is Russian propaganda. <laughs> That's insane. Ukraine is not weak. All right, Lindsay, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, did, did you guys hang out on Union already this week? Did you no, you Union? didn't. No, I was on Union. I don't think Lindsay can make it, but no, yeah, we'll see really again there. We'll to. see you again there sometime. Yeah, I love I love being there and being able to do that. And thank you so much for having me. It's so fun to hang out with yeah, you. Yeah, this has been talk, great. Talk about shit and whatever. So it'll be good to have you back on Rogue again sometime. And yeah, right yeah. on. We'll talk soon. Cool. Okay. Bye, take care. Lindsay. Bye. Bye. And that was a chat with Lindsay from Rogue Ways. What'd well, you think, that was buddy? good. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, learned a lot about her that I didn't know. Were we on her show before? Yes, we were. Was yeah. I there? Yeah, you were there. Yeah. Huh. A while back. Yeah. Was it a few years ago? Uh, Yeah, a couple of years it must ago. must have been yeah. a few years ago now, right? Eh? Yeah. It all starts to blend together. I mean, we've I've probably done almost like a thousand podcasts between all the shit we've done and all the shows we've gone on. Yeah. Yeah. Last podcast. Yeah, I was on. Uh, well, I mean, might as well shout it out now. I was on uh, Rising from the Ashes the other day, talking about our audiobooks. Was not we were on that show yesterday? I was on that show yeah, you, you, we were on that before too. Yeah, I went on talking about audiobooks and the pre the myths from pre Columbian America. Yeah, huh. <laughs> yeah, yesterday. So shout know, out, right. shout out to those guys down in Naki Dad, Romy? Homie Romy. Yeah, oh, yeah, I've been talking about Romy. We're going to collaborate on a Hawaii event. Nice. So that should be fun. We'll figure that out over the next couple of years. I mean, this year is just fucking jam-packed already. There is, like, one spot left for Utah, maybe, if you email me. And uh, we'll see what we can do there. There's one spot left for Montana, a bunch of spots left for Scablands. I don't know where Egypt's at, but it's fucking close to sold out, too, if it's not already. Uh, join the chats. America.ca slash chats. Anything else? No, I think that's about it. I'll put all the links to all that stuff we talked about in the show notes. All right. We love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. You just a drop in the bucket, baby. Just a single solitary drop in the bucket, baby. You just a drop in the bucket, baby. You just a single solitary drop in the bucket, baby. Baby. down on my bended knee and howl at the moon oh and I drop down on my bended knee pinching pennies la da 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 Yeah.
out the scenery Rambling from here and there and back and forth between here and there and back and forth between here and there and to the corner store The sunrise corner store The sunrise corner store The sunrise corner store Pinching pennies Da 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 Myself a dog to be my best. 